Dear church family, we're living in troubling days. We've endured months of lockdown, isolation, so that we've been unable to gather, at least until today, as a full church family, without any restrictions, as we love to do. And yet even tonight, we had to alter things through God's providence again. Today is called to be a a wonderful day of celebration, a day of Pentecost, a day of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But clouds have overshadowed also this day, clouds impacting our nation and our city, clouds that make us grieve and lament, clouds that call us to repentance. So even as the cloud of COVID-19 is still hovering over us, the cloud of the tragic, horrifying death of George Floyd has entered the American scene and created, as you know, a wave of, uh, of at first peaceful protests, but they've turned violent and lawless. And so grief has turned to anger. And anger is turned to violence. And violence is turned to injustice. And injustice begets more injustice. And this whole cycle that can lead to anarchy, we don't know. But it ought to certainly give us pause and cause to grieve and to lament. To lament not only for problems out there on the streets but also problems even in our own minds, in our own souls, in our lack of repentance, in our lack of really understanding, not just as Martin, Dr. Kivenhoven prayed this morning, what's going through the, the mind of many African Americans when they witnessed uh, the death of George Floyd, but also problems with not really coming before God in genuine repentance, even when He calls us to that in so many ways. And certainly what we need most of all now is that repentance and revival that flows out of genuine, Spirit-worked, Spirit-blessed repentance. And so we have a lot We have a lot to do in the inner closet, in prayer, not just as a congregation, but also in our own families and in our own souls. Now, Peter is really calling in, in his entire sermon people to repentance, and God blesses it, 3,000 repent, And it leads to this amazing revival. And I want to look with you this evening at six marks of the Pentecostal revival that are typical of all revivals from just using these words in Acts 2.33 where we read, or Acts 2.33. I'm sorry, Acts 2, 41b. Yeah, 41b. The same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So our theme then this evening is Pentecost, six marks of revival needed today. This morning, Dr. Kivenhoven brought us a, a very fitting message for Pentecost on the opening section of Peter's famous sermon that resulted in revival. And we saw how that the revival of Acts 2 really was the culmination of the prophecy of Joel in Joel 2. And he concluded with an appeal to all of us to to call on the name of the Lord and we shall be saved. Well, Peter goes on in his sermon 
by connecting that gift of the Holy Spirit that gives salvation with the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. He sketches the character and life of Jesus, his humanity, verse 22, then his miracles, his wonders, his signs. You see, he's preaching Jesus. Then his crucifixion, verse 23. And then he astonishes the audience in 24 through 32 by explaining to him that Jesus has really risen from the dead and he's the Messiah and the Christ. And he goes back and explains, interweaving that with Psalm 16, how that this is the fulfillment also of that passage and also of Zechariah 12, verse 10, which I was going to preach on tonight, but we'll hear in a few weeks, God willing. And then moves on to preach in verse 33 that he's not only risen, but he's ascended into heaven. And he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And he's coming again to judge the living and the dead. And he refers back to Psalm 110. As we heard this morning, you see everything is grounded in the Old Testament Scriptures. And so really what Peter is doing is he's preaching Jesus. Jesus in his humiliation. Jesus in his exaltation. And then he concludes by saying to the people in verse 36, God has made that same Jesus. This is a summary of the whole sermon. Whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And whether that was the end of the sermon or the people were just so overwhelmed with conviction of sin that they interrupted Peter, we don't really know, but they cried out at that moment while he was still preaching, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter gives the answer. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. And they do, by the grace of God, they do repent. And 3,000 are added to the church. The church was multiplied from 120 to 3,120 under one sermon. That's astonishing. That's genuine revival. Now, there are three views of revival today that are current in evangelical churches. In mid-level, midstream evangelical churches, most of which are Arminian. The, the idea of revival is that man can produce it. If you just push the right buttons, say the right things, work the right emotions, have people raise their hand, come down an aisle, you can work revival. Well, that certainly is not a biblical understanding of revival. The second view of revival is to call it renewal. And the idea there is that the Holy Spirit has been poured out on Pentecost and he's with his church to the end of time, all of which is true. And therefore, the gradual renewal throughout the last 2,000 years is one long revival. But that certainly is not the biblical view of revival. Revival, as we heard this morning, is a heightened period of time in church history in which the Spirit descends with an almighty, unusual power, where conviction of sin is deeper and, and revelation of Christ through the Word to the soul is more fervent. And many more are brought to know the Lord in truth. In revival, the work of God is multiplied quantitatively in numbers and qualitatively in depth. But what are the marks of that revival, that kind of genuine, God-given revival? Well, mark number one is that such a revival is always, always the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. Its existence, its timing, its depth, its numbers are all determined by God. The last verse of Acts 2 says, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And Acts 13, 48 says, and as many, as, as another wave of revival followed, as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. So authentic revival 
can never be manufactured by man. It's not a result of certain processes in history or done as the fruit of mere human zeal or endeavor. A revival is the rending of the heavens, divine intervention among the affairs of men. And it's prompted by the same mysterious, powerful influence of the Holy Spirit that belongs to the supernaturalism of every conversion of the New Testament age. It's the Spirit poured out in individual souls, but then in large numbers. That's the only way to explain why 3,000 could be converted on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. Why, why weren't they converted in Athens or in Rome? Or why was one preacher greatly used in one place and not in another? Or why, when Jonathan Edwards preached his sermon, famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, in a congregation other than his own, were a hundred saved. And when he preached it in his own church, no one was saved. You see, with respect to time and place and instrumentality, all attempts to account for authentic revival in mere human terms breaks down. Revival is independent of human support, human sympathy, without the work of God's Spirit. What's true of every individual conversion is true of revival as a whole. Jesus said, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And so, revival is something to pray for. Something to cry out to the heavens for. It's something God has done in ages past, and He can do it again. And so we don't pray for revivalism, which is a man-made system, but we pray for revival, which is a spirit-worked display of almighty, sovereign, one-sided grace. But Mark number two in revival, Acts 2, Pentecostal revival, is that revival is preceded by a remarkable effusion of prayer. Even though revival is solely the work of God, it's God's normal way by His Spirit to stir up in His own people a spirit of prayer and supplication. The Bible just doesn't say the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man, singular, availeth much. That is true. But the Bible also shows again and again, especially throughout the book of Acts, that when the people of God gathered together in corporate prayer, God poured out His Spirit and wave after wave after wave after wave of revival took place upon prayer. Corporate prayer under the Spirit's tutelage. And so, it's not just these 3,000. By Acts 9, there were 20,000 converts. That's a huge part of the population of the world at that time. It's remarkable. And you read again and again before the revivals were there, there was a spirit of prayer, a spirit of prayer. Now, the last time America has seen a great revival you probably know, it was in 1857. And it began in New York City. It began with six people gathering in a restaurant during their business hour luncheon, praying together. And the six became 10. And the 10 became 20. The 20 became 50. The restaurant couldn't hold them, so they began to hold prayer meetings at lunch in different parts of the city. And from there... It went north all the way up to Maine. It went south all the way to Philadelphia. And then it went west all the way to Chicago. And by 1859, 
It said there were up to 500,000 people in America genuinely saved. Prayer was the Spirit's means to germinate the seed of revival. Matthew Henry said, When God designs mercy upon a people, He stirs up the spirit of prayer. The Puritan William Grinnell put it even more quaintly. He said, The cocks crow thickest toward the break of day. This is what happened at Pentecost. The 120 were gathered in prayer for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. This is what we need. The spirit of prayer. We've got to stop the attitude that we don't need corporate prayer. Now, it's wonderful. There are small groups praying in different houses. I'm very well aware of that. In, in our church. That's, that's wonderful. This ought ye to have done, but not to have left the other undone. We have a corporate prayer meeting. And they're starting up again after the COVID period. This week, Wednesday, bring your family, bring your children. Let us cry out to the heavens that God will revive His church in the midst of the years, in the midst of wrath, make known His mercy. 120. It began with them, by the grace of the Spirit, crying out to God. And it resulted in tens of thousands being brought into the kingdom of God. See, New Testament believers did not minimize prayer because they knew revival was promised. Jesus had said, he was going to send his spirit. There was going to be a, a time of awakening. But they didn't sit back and say, well, since the Holy Spirit has to do it, therefore we won't engage in earnest prayer. The point is that God uses prayer and revival together. Prayer is not the cause of revival, but prayer is what God uses. Prayer is a means God uses to stir up revival. The promises of God, that revival was coming, simply roused them up to more prayer. And there are promises of God in the Bible still today about the last days that are not fulfilled. Some, of course, are grim statements about the end days where the ungodly will become more ungodly. But there are other promises that say the godly will become more godly. We need to plead those promises, you see. We need to plead those promises in our own corporate prayer, in our own private prayers, in our own family prayers. We ought to be acting in church prayer, in corporate prayer meetings, in family prayer, in private prayer. We ought to be acting like a child who's received a promise from her father to get her something she desires. Perhaps you've heard that story of a, of a little girl who did that. She met her father every day when he arrived home from work saying, Daddy, did you get it yet? Did you get it yet? Until the father finally relented and, and gave it to her. Like, like, like the unfortunate widow we read of in Scripture. As true believers especially, we ought to be pleading for God as like unfortunate widows that he will break through the clouds or break open the clouds. And instead of judgment, would pour down the showers of revival benediction. So could it be, I'm just asking as a question, could it be that the lack of prayer, humanly speaking, is the reasons why, is the main reason why we've witnessed so little revival in 160 years? To the point now we don't even expect it. We don't expect it. None of us have seen it in our lifetime. And so we've become accustomed to living without revival and without many conversions. Think back to George Whitfield. <clears throat> I'll never forget reading in his diary one day <clears throat> these words. 
<clears throat> Lord, I've heard of no conversions under my ministry for two weeks. What's wrong with me? Two weeks. Mark number three. Revival usually begins in the church. Revival begins in the church with the reawakening and enlightening of those who've already been born again. That's what Acts 2 teaches us and all of church history as well. Actually, revival often begins with ministers and elders and church leaders stirred up to a spirit of prayer and spills over to the people. Or sometimes, in, in Scotland at least, it began with children who were converted crying out to God. Children were having prayer meetings in a barn in several places of Scotland, and those prayer meetings impacted their parents, and their parents impacted the church leaders, but it begins with people who are believers. It doesn't begin with unbelieving people. You see, small groups gather together, crying out to God, feeling the need for revival. Is the way God usually begins it. And of course, as believers, we ought to be ashamed that personal revival is even necessary. After all, our God is so rich and so good. We ought to be serving Him every day, appropriating by faith our riches in Christ, obeying His will, renouncing evil, having the highest joy in Him, the deepest peace, the fullest measure of His power. As we heard this morning, we live far below our New Testament privileges. We live at a substandard level. We've left our first love. We've grown spiritually cold. And when there's coldness settling in us, we become powerless. And then we get more enamored with the temporal things of this world than we do the eternal of the heavenly world. So we need to go back. We need to repent. We need to remember from where we've fallen. We need to cast out lukewarmness. And God, we must appeal to God to revive us with childlike faith, with heartfelt repentance, with unswerving obedience, with loving service. It needs to begin with us, with me, with you. The church's recovery of truth has been compared to a sunrise in a mountainous region. First, the, the sun shines on the tops of the mountains. Then as the day proceeds, it reaches down into the valleys. And so recovery of truth, said one of our forefathers, often shines upon the leaders of the church, some of the members, and then through their influence, being blessed by the Spirit, it reaches down, down into the average pew, and then beyond that, out into the world. We who have the most privileges are the most responsible to be crying out for revival. Mark number four. Remarkable, authentic revival and spiritual growth results from the Spirit joining Himself to the Word of God. We heard a bit about that this morning as well. But here you see it in the rest of Peter's sermon, vividly, joining himself to the written word, that's number one, and joining himself to the living word, Jesus, which is number two. So what happens, you see, <clears throat> is not only in Peter's sermon, but to the end of the world, when the Spirit works in people, he works through the word. And there's an enlightening uh, Dr. Kivenhoven called it this morning, an illuminating power of the Holy Spirit that works through that word. That's why 12 of Peter's 22 verses are recorded in this sermon, are, are simply Bible texts, Old Testament texts. The Spirit is bearing witness to the word. Psalm 107.20 says, He sent His word and healed them. <clears throat> 
So the conclusion of all of this is, is obvious, isn't it? We don't need man-made gimmicks. We don't need modern entertainment. In a church worship service, we just need the word of truth and the spirit of truth working together with power. So our sermon must begin with the word. It must end with the word. Whether it's preached individually, one text at a time, or a pericope of ten verses at a time, or topically, that doesn't make any difference. We bring the Word of God, and this, the instrument, you see, of salvation is the Word of God. The power is the Spirit of God. The result is the salvation of God, and the end is the glory of God. That's how the Spirit works revival. The Spirit joins Himself to the written Word. And when the Spirit joins Himself to the written Word, since the written Word is full of the living Word, Jesus, as, it, as Peter's sermon is full of Jesus here, you see, it's Jesus ultimately that's being preached. Of course we have to preach about man's deep fall in Adam, about our need for repentance, about the necessity of regeneration and faith and repentance. But, but ultimately, you see, all of that leads to preaching about the solution, about the one person needed. No other name but Jesus can set us free. And so Peter preaches, really in this sermon, he preaches the whole counsel of God, but it's laser-beamed on Jesus. He preaches Christ's death and Christ's resurrection for lost sinners. He calls for faith and repentance toward that Lord Jesus Christ. And so revival is the Spirit taking the preaching of the living Word and bringing it home with power to the lives and hearts of sinners. Is that, what, is that what's going on in your heart? Even tonight, this year, this week, the power of the written and living word, is it by this that you live? Is it by this you wish, you wish to die? Do you search the word? Do you, do you love the word? Do you strive in dependency on the spirit to live the word? And then Mark number five. Spirit work revival is honest with the souls of men for the call to repentance must be coupled with a rediscovery of truth. The call to repentance must be coupled with a rediscovery of truth. You see, Peter didn't mince any words. He didn't flatter his listeners. In fact, twice he told them that they had crucified the very Messiah who could save them. Peter, whose name means the rock, is a rock here. He's solid. The same man who trembled before his servant girl is now fearless. This is by the power of the Spirit. Peter could do this. But in himself, he was just a fearful man. He feared drowning in Matthew 14. He feared mockery and telling the truth to a servant girl in John 18. But now... He doesn't fear to stand up before a multitude of thousands and say in verse 23, Him, Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Pentecost is a turning point in Peter's life. He's now forgetting about himself. He's now an ambassador of Christ. He tells people the truth. They absolutely need to repent. Repent, for you have crucified the Lord of glory. That's his message. That's the message we heard this morning. It's really the message of tonight. If we don't repent, we either are backslidden Christians and we'll pay a price for it, or we're not Christians at all. And we need to repent. There's no other way to come to the Lord of glory, but through a way of faith and repentance. And that leads me to my sixth mark. Spirit work revival is always accompanied by saving faith. You see it in verse 41. You see it again in verse 44. In fact, someone has counted 3,000 texts in the Bible 
that talk about, in one way or another, faith and repentance as requisite in the coming to Jesus. Hebrews 11.33 says, faith subdued kingdoms, faith wrought righteousness, faith obtained promises, faith stopped the mouths of lions. Faith in God's promises. Not faith in your faith. Not faith in something you accomplish. Not faith as a work, but faith in God. Faith in Christ. Faith in the promises of God. You remember when John Bunyan has Christian and hopeful fall asleep on the grounds of giant despair and they're taken in chains into Doubting Castle? And in that miserable hole, they're terrified by the giant as he shows them the bones of various pilgrims. He's smashed and broken to pieces. And he says, so it shall be with you. And Christian and hopeful are terrified, Bunyan says, until Saturday night. And they begin to pray. And they continue to pray throughout the whole night. And finally at dawn, Christian suddenly stands up and he says to hopeful, oh, what a fool am I. Thus to lie in a stinking dungeon, when I may as well walk at liberty, for I have a key in my bosom called promise. And that key will, I am persuaded, open any lock in this doubting castle. And Hopeful says, well, my brother, that's good news. Pluck it out of thy bosom and try. And Christian takes the key out, and he goes to the first lock. It unlocks and the next one, and the next gate, and the next gate. And it brings him through all the grim doors of Doubting Castle, out into freedom. You see, so it is with the church. So it is with the believer today. We're helpless. We're bereft of strength. But God has commanded us to pray in faith on his promises. And he has promised, you won't seek my face in vain. Heard it this morning. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. And so when the church truly prays in her prayers, she is clothed with the Spirit's fire from heaven. Well, I want to conclude this short sermon by asking you just one question. And let me develop it for five minutes and I'll be done. Are you an asset or are you a hindrance to revival? Are you an asset or are you a hindrance to revival? You see, we are hindrances when we're just satisfied with, with mere tradition. Tradition is valuable when it's grounded on Scripture, and some traditions are, are natural to develop. But if we're satisfied, with mere tradition, while lacking the life and power of godliness, we're, we're a hindrance to revival. Do we read our Bibles? Do we pray? Do we attend church? Is it mere form or tradition? Do we use Christianity to just quiet our consciences? Or do we really live for Christ? And really yearn for his bride to flourish in this world. Are we evangelists? As we heard this morning again. We're also hindrances when we fail to be intercessors for the eternal well-being of others. An important part of prayer is praying for others. What kind of an intercessor are you? Someone in your family unsaved? Are you crying to the heavens for their salvation? How often, how many people are you praying for? How many people have you taken on the wings of prayer to God? And then we're hindrances to revival because of our cursed, cursed unbelief. Few of us, I'm afraid, realize how serious an enemy unbelief is, how contrary unbelief is to the spirit of revival. I still remember one of our old members who passed into 
the presence of Christ maybe 20 years ago, sitting on my couch, back on romance, and just weeping his eyes out in front of me and saying, oh, my cursed, my cursed, my cursed unbelief. Do you hate unbelief? Do you see it as a chief sin in you that needs to be destroyed? Do you long for a life of faith? Are you pleading for it? Are you, are you, are you following John Newton's advice that we're coming to a king, large petitions would he bring, for his grace and power are such, none can ever ask too much. Does that mean we are to expect another Pentecost? I don't know. Numbers aren't the point, though. The point is, do we believe in God? Do we believe the Holy Spirit can do a mighty work? Are we crying out to the heavens, O Lord, revive thy work. In wrath, remember mercy. Open the doors and the windows of heaven and come down with revival blessings. That's the way to be an asset to revival. In the midst of the 1859 revival, James W. Alexander preached a sermon. And at the end of that sermon, he asked his hearers these words in closing. Are you an enemy of revival? Do you rejoice in revival? Are you a subject of revival? Do you pray for revival? Are you helping revival forward? Does your heart care for the fruits of revival? Have you sought to honor God in revival? And do your, does your faith, do your faith and life show that you are living in the age of the Spirit, the age of Pentecost, the age of potential revival? Amen. Great God of heaven, we ask thy benediction upon this short message, and we pray for revival. We pray for prayer. We pray for an earnest sense of what is our great need in our time of urgency. And we pray, Lord, that all the circumstances in which we find ourselves, and this city as well, may move us to call for a rending of the heavens, to come down and revive thy church and revive America and revive Grand Rapids and revive our own hearts with the amazing work of thy Holy Spirit, convicting us of sin, leading us to Jesus and enabling us to pursue holiness and to zealously live for the cause and kingdom of our beautiful, matchless, glorious, strong Redeemer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.